drawing one's own map, sharing information on the playground, countless after-school play sessions lost in a fantasy world. There's nothing wrong with having fond memories of our childhoods. Memories make us rich, but these memories are unique to the owner. They are non-transferable. They cannot be uploaded for someone else to experience. Well, not yet, anyway. Super Metroid is the third game in the iconic Metroid franchise and picks up right where the first two installments left off. However, instead of continuing to pay homage to the classic Alien films, the story now goes its own way. Like the previous games, Super Metroid opens with a haunting title screen, only now information is being presented. The Metroid hatchling is in a lab, but the scientists have been incapacitated. Samus receives a distress signal from the space station and investigates. This opening scene acts like a sandbox to explore Samus' moveset, which has been expanded. Samus can now run with the added run button, as well as shoot diagonally. Of course, there is nothing to shoot at or run from, so yeah. The player will eventually reach a dead end, along with the Metroid hatchling recovered from the second game, when suddenly, Ridley from the first game appears from the shadows. Ridley cannot be defeated and Samus cannot die here. Instead, this is an interactive cutscene. Ridley escapes with the hatchling and Samus' objective is to return to planet Zebus to defeat the space pirates once again, who are no doubt planning to use the Metroids for no good. Super Metroid could have easily explained this with text, but I appreciate them doing things the hard way. Next, Samus returns to Planet Zebus and the game kicks off proper. Other than finding Ridley and the Hatchling, Super Metroid does not offer a clear objective for the player. Instead, one must explore the planet and figure out the way forward. Going right leads to a wall, paying homage to the series staple of being a somewhat open world game. Within the first few moments, Super Metroid begins communicating gameplay elements to the player. It is obvious the tunnel at the beginning of the game can be broken thanks to the map not having a white outline on the grid block. These rocks again appear as the player travels left, cluing the player to a potential progression point, despite the map making it seem like this is the edge of the world. As the player progresses, they will continue to encounter areas where Samus cannot pass as she seems to have lost the morph ball. But again, the player should be making more mental notes of future progression points as power-ups are reobtained. Something else the player should notice is the lack of life on Zebus. At the end of Metroid 1, a bomb went off and it does not seem life has recovered. The lack of branching paths also pushes the player straight to Turian, the final area of Samus' first adventure on Zebus. The player will see the runes of Mother Brain and the Morph Ball is waiting in the same location as before. This does not make sense from a continuity perspective, but another piece of narrative is offered upon collection. Samus is not alone. A searchlight appears and follows her. Something intelligent is watching. As Samus presses on, Onward through familiar territory, a red door cannot be opened, but the missile upgrade is just a few screens away, hinting at the item needed to pass through. And this is where the nostalgia trip ends, well, for now. As Samus backtracks through Torian, enemies now appear, as if a switch turned on and everything has turned against Samus once again. With the morph ball and missiles obtained, players can begin exploring the areas previously gated off. One of the first things the player should find is a map room. Mercifully, Super Metroid includes a built-in map. This tracks the player's progress, offering information needed to plot the next move. These map rooms will also fill in unexplored areas of the various locations, giving the player even more information on how to proceed. This is a massive leap forward in the Metroid franchise. The lack of a map made the first game needlessly confusing, making it difficult to plot a path forward through the game's dubious world. Changes were made in Metroid 2 to alleviate the lack of a map, with a more intuitive layout from the game's opening moments to the final ones. Super Metroid continues to evolve the formula, easing off on the linearity found in the second game but complementing it with a fully realized map system. And man, does this make progression a ton smoother. It doesn't handhold the player either, as noted earlier with the white borders disguising this breakable wall. Instead, it continues the design philosophy of offering the player clues and then letting the player figure out how to solve the obstacle. It is so brilliantly implemented, I never had to 
consult an online resource to figure out where to go next. Another thing the game designers like to do is temporarily not allow backtracking. Upon discovering the bombs, the player cannot leave the room as an unbreakable door appears. This forces the player to stay in the room as the Chozo statue comes to life and begins attacking. It is not until defeat the door unlocks. While this mini boss fight is tame, it is a surprise, similar to the many surprises greeting the player in the second game. The player is required to tackle this mini boss too, as one cannot leave this area of criteria without the power up. The bomb upgrade then allows access to the next leg of the journey. This idea of trapping the player in an area is repeated throughout Super Metroid. Later on in Brinstar, the player will drop down a large pit and cannot go back up without the aid of a future item. And yes, I am aware that a skilled player could probably wall jump out of here, but this is not taught to the player until later on. Super Metroid is constantly controlling the pace of the player's progression, but it does so in a subtle way. The player can see so many areas but cannot reach many of them, including a platform that cannot be reached, rooms that cause the player damage, and areas clearly needing more speed. These moments push the player along a linear stretch to the first boss. Thanks to these roadblocks, it never feels overwhelming on where to go next. This one-way door switch prevents backtracking through Brinstar, for example, forcibly preventing players from backtracking until later on in the adventure, reducing wasted time. As the player nears the first real boss of the game, they will notice a familiar looking entrance, but it cannot be reached as Samus's jump is too low. However, a few rooms away are the high jump boots. The player cannot leave this room without them either, forcing the player to grab the item even if they are afraid of the statue coming to life, and Super Metroid shows the increased height at which Samus can now jump, letting the player access the strange looking door found a few moments before. Another great design touch is with the bombs. If an item can be used to progress through an impassable object, an icon will show on the screen. When the player finds the upgrades, there are icons. A player then knows when they have obtained the correct item to overcome the previous obstacle, eliminating trial and error guesswork. This attention to detail is amazing, and it is obvious the developers were looking to improve upon some of the more obtuse moments from the previous games. Just before reaching the first boss, a new type of door is revealed, a boss door. These are nice clues to the obstacle at hand, letting the player stock up on health and missiles prior to engaging with a boss, if one so chooses. And with that, the player is seamlessly guided to the game's first boss, Kraid. I love how the game guides the player to the first boss. There is a breadcrumb of items and places to use the items to guide the player to the encounter. There are plenty of branching paths, rewarding exploration, and plenty of areas where the game really wants the player to make a mental note of an obstacle needing an upgrade to be solved. I never felt like Super Metroid was holding my hand, but I also never felt like the game was being overly cryptic either. Super Metroid begins fairly easy as well, rewarding cautious play with a smooth experience. Now, if this were Metroid 1, the awesome design would simply stop. The rest of Zebus would be fully explorable, and the player would be offered no clues on how to finish the adventure and rescue the Metroid Hatchling or defeat Ridley, or whatever it is Samus is supposed to do. However, Super Metroid is relentless in its quest to be a well-designed adventure, all the way to the very end. Thankfully, it is also relentless in its quest to not hold the player's hand, but rather offer the player clues and reward critical thinking, and of course encourage and demand the player explore, and there are no excuses not to explore every nook and cranny of Zebus, thanks to the map. The next three power-ups obtained are the Various Suit, which reduces damage and allows Samus to traverse heated areas, the Speed Booster, allowing even faster running, and the Ice Beam. The Ice Beam is of course the item needed to escape Norfair and return up to Brinstar, which was previously gated off. I cannot stress enough how well-crafted Super Metroid is, from both a progression standpoint and a design standpoint. The Various Suit is rewarded for defeating Kraid. This allows access to the heated areas of Norfair which leads to the speed booster. This is another awesome moment where the game communicates to the player what an item does, without a text box explaining it. Leading to the room containing the item is a long corridor with collapsing floors. At first over empty pits and then over hazards, a player will naturally hold the run button to get through. After obtaining the power up, a player will instinctively hold the run button on the way back, which will then reveal the true nature of the power up. It is a lovely piece of design and an example example of backtracking done right. With the speed booster, the player can access another area of Norfair. 
Super Metroid locks the player in this section too, meaning the player has to use thought and logic to figure out how to escape. Players should reach a dead end of sorts, but see they need to move right. Exploring the limited area should reveal a small passage for the Morph Ball, leading to the Ice Beam. Upon returning to that earlier room, one should deduce frozen enemies are the key over the lava pit and ultimately out of this area. With the Ice Beam obtained and the proper teaching moment offered, players can finally travel back up Brinstar and continue forward. This is a somewhat strange area though. When going up, the player should notice a single block on the map screen with an item. The player's goal should be to figure out how to reach that space. The answer is bombing, but where the first game was a trial and error bomb fest, Super Metroid gives the player environmental clues on where to bomb, which is far more thoughtful. Now, while I have praised Super Metroid's design up to this point, this was the first obstacle on my initial playthrough. I thought I was done with Norfair. After all, the game sent me upwards with the ice beam. On my first playthrough, I looped back through the entire game world, using the new power-ups to unlock new locations of the previously explored areas, trying to find the path forward. After all the running around, I had completely forgotten about a few power-bombable areas back in Norfair. You see, Super Metroid sends the player all the way up the shaft to collect the power bomb. However, to move forward with the adventure, the player needs to then backtrack to where they just were. I had forgotten about this door and this bombable floor, because I thought the game wanted wanted me to continue upwards and not back downwards. This is not bad per se, but a moment where the game briefly does not quite make sense. Anyway, after defeating another mid-boss, players will start to notice many strange blocks with a cross on them. Same as before, the player should be making mental notes of these areas and know another power-up will surely unlock the next big area of Zebes. Moving on, Samus arrives to one of my favorite puzzles in the entire game. I alluded to the map not being a hand-holding crutch in Super Metroid. In this area, the player is stuck. However, some bombing will reveal blocks needing to be destroyed with a power bomb. However, this simply clears them out of the way, not revealing any items or secret paths. However, it does create a runway with a ramp. Should the player put all of these clues together, they will make a massive leap, leading the way forward. This is a rather tricky puzzle, but the clues are all there for the player to put together the solution, including the open area shown on the map. It does not handhold the player, but does not feel over really mean either. It is just, well, good. This leap leads to the grapple beam, which can be used on those odd blocks, and the player can move to a brand new area, the wrecked ship. Alternatively, they could revisit past areas and explore for power-ups, which is what I chose to do on this playthrough. With the grapple beam, new energy tanks and weapon upgrades can be obtained. The grapple beam also allows one to secure the x-ray scope, which reveals hidden secrets buried in Zebes. With all of these new power-ups, I was able to fall down a pit and learn the super jump maneuver. This is not required to beat the game, but is required for 100% completion. The wall jump is also taught to the player with little animals guiding the player to bounce from wall to wall. If I am honest, this maneuver feels janky with strict timing. Bumping up on the directional pad also seems to cancel it completely, requiring serious precision to execute. As best as I can tell, the wall jump is only necessary in one section of the game, leading to the spring ball, which is the intended way to get through this obstacle, as far as I can tell. As the wall jump is only needed once to beat the game, I am not too annoyed at its stingy implementation, but newcomers are likely to struggle to get the timing and inputs just right. Even with all of these new power-ups and abilities, I still located two areas I was unable to pass, meaning it was time to return to the linear path of the adventure. So, back to the wrecked ship. The save point nor the doors in the wrecked ship work, meaning it appears to have lost power. But after defeating the second of the four main bosses, the area comes alive and the player can explore the rest of the ship. Another example of Super Metroid gating areas off and guiding the player forward, without it feeling too restrictive. With the ship powered on, one should find a water area right away, but Samus's mobility in water is severely hampered, preventing her from making a simple jump. Same as always, this clues the player into another item needed to progress. Prior to obtaining this item, the player arrives at a Chozo statue, which contains no item. Using the Morph Ball to mimic where the item would sit brings the statue to life, only this time it helps Samus, as if Samus was the key to make it work. The player is then able to obtain the Gravity Suit, which further reduces enemy damage and allows the player to move freely underwater. And how does one know they can move freely underwater? Because after grabbing the 
suit and moving through the next door, they are trapped right into it. One should immediately recognize the newfound dexterity underwater, without the game having to spell it out. As I said, the design touches and map design are expertly crafted throughout the entire game. With the gravity suit, the player is led to another new area of Zebus, Meridia. This is a water world and continues the trend of noticing areas inaccessible without upgrades, using gaps in the map to find secret passages, and baiting a boss to unlock another mission critical upgrade. This time the space jump. Much like Metroid 2, the space jump requires precise timing to use, and again I struggle to come to grips with it. When one gets in the groove, it is amazing, but traversing upward feels clumsy, and I feel like this is something that should have been improved. Unlike the wall jump, which is rarely if ever needed to beat the game, the space jump is relied upon heavily in the final gauntlet of the game. Players should have noticed an area at the beginning of Meridia not normally accessible either, and this space jump does allow access to the final area of the water world. Inside is the plasma beam, further increasing the damage output of the arm cannon. With the three main bosses down, there is just one to go. It is here where I had my second roadblock in Super Metroid on my initial playthrough. It has been a long time since the player stumbled upon this section of Norfair, and I had forgotten about it. When I did stumble upon it again, I had incorrectly assumed there was some way to lower the lava below, allowing for progression. However, this was incorrect. It turns out the gravity suit allows the player to walk in lava without taking damage, something that never occurred to me and is not in the manual either. There are no teaching moments for this, so the player is left to figure it out. Considering every other item is taught to the player seamlessly, it seems like there was an opportunity for this as well, but alas, there is not. The final moments of the game are straightforward. Enemies are far tougher with long invincibility periods, others require the screw attack, the game's final upgrade, and there are auto-scrolling sections requiring the player to move quickly. The path forward is often obscure, demanding bombing or using the x-ray scope to see the path forward. Super Metroid demands the player master all of the mechanics to get to the final boss, Ridley. After defeating Ridley, the narrative picks back up again. The Metroid found in the second game and stolen by Ridley has escaped its container. One might wonder where it could be. Well, with the four bosses defeated, the player can finish exploring the last of Zebus with the gravity suit and screw attack, but ultimately must make their way to the statue room found early on in the game. By defeating the four bosses, these statues will reveal the path forward to the final moments of the game. Metroid 1 hinted peace was temporary, and it turns out the space pirates have rebuilt. While this was the epic climax in the first game, in Super Metroid, defeating Ridley is the climax. It is the toughest boss in the game, and it took me forever to find a working strategy on my first playthrough. What remains in the adventure is more plot than anything, and acts as a cooldown to the final credits, or an interactive cutscene similar to the opening. Anyway, Samus is attacked by a Super Metroid, which nearly kills her, but it stops right before the end, with just a single hit point remaining. As it zips off, one can only conclude this is the Metroid that broke free from the canister, and the one Samus imprinted on back on SR388. And this is an important thing to note. As Samus makes her way through a rebuilt Mother Brain, which is quite easy, another surprise is presented. Mother Brain now has a second phase. After dishing enough damage, this freakish incarnation blasts Samus with a massive, inescapable beam. Thankfully, the Super Metroid comes to the rescue, sucking power from Mother Brain and giving it to Samus before being destroyed. A self-sacrifice, I suppose. Defeating Mother Brain is now a formality, and defeat brings another self-destruct sequence forcing the player to race back to Samus's ship before time expires. And that is it. It is another simple story of Samus the bounty hunter going on a mission to save the galaxy. The space pirates and the Metroids are once again neutralized. While simple, there were some plot twists along the way, which I appreciate. There are also some questions left unanswered, like what is the relationship between Samus and the Chozo? And how did Kraid and Ridley come back to life after seemingly being obliterated? It leaves room for a sequel, but also comes to a satisfying conclusion, the way a third game in a trilogy should.
So far, this video has been mostly glowing of Super Metroid. I truly feel the design of Zebus is outstanding. The game does a perfect job guiding the player along from beat to beat, without ever feeling too handholdy or tutorialized. Players will feel clever when they solve puzzles, and this feeling of satisfaction is never robbed from the player. Progression is still linear, but the looping world does lend a feeling of open world design, letting the player freely visit the world once they are sufficiently powered, rewarding energy tanks and increased weapon capacity capacity for those inclined to seek them out. Backtracking is also not prevalent. In fact, new upgrades will often allow the player to skip past large portions of the world, which keeps the pacing of the game brisk, rather than feeling grindy. Health and missile refills are also strategically placed, preventing players from having to grind enemies to get back up to full strength. The only time I had to grind was before the Ridley fight, but this went quickly thanks to the placement of the enemy generators and the power of Samus towards the end of the game, so it did not feel like a pace-breaking pain. The thought, logic, and care placed into the adventure from beginning to end is surprising. Moreover, I can confidently say online resources are not necessary for a normal playthrough for an average skilled player. However, I do not think the controls are as polished as the game world. Samus still feels stiff and clunky, and the things I did not like about the controls remain from the previous titles. The jumping remains unchanged, meaning at times the developers designed rooms that do not really fit the moveset of Samus. Tight jumps with obstacles on the floor and ceiling are a giant pain, and I feel like I am fighting against the controls, rather than the level design challenging my skills. The wall jump and space jump feel super janky, and even after 12 hours of play, I still do not have a firm grasp on the timing required on either maneuver. I guess the designers wanted such powerful moves to require expert precision, a form of balance, but it comes off as feeling substandard. I do not understand how the overall game design could be tweaked and massaged to perfection, but the controls left largely unchanged. It feels like a real missed opportunity. Then there are the bosses. If I am honest, Super Metroid is not a hard game. Part of this is because of the intuitive design, which is a good thing. Part of it is because the bosses do not pose a challenge. This becomes evident as soon as the first sub-boss. The projectiles can be shot and reveal power-ups. As long as one is farming for health, it is nearly impossible to fail. One could argue this is a good way to ease the player into the flow of the boss fights, and I would agree. However, the general philosophy carries through the entire game. If a player has enough health, be it from bosses themselves or from energy tank upgrades, being aggressive and tanking is always an adequate strategy. No matter how badly I mistimed attacks, I would find myself victorious. The bosses are not designed in a way where strategy, pattern recognition, and skill are needed in order to defeat them. Rather, it simply feels like the bounty hunter overmatches bosses. Much like the controls, the boss encounters have not improved over the previous two installments. One might say the player has earned an easier encounter if they went out of their way to find health and, more importantly, super missile increases, but I would say this is an example of the game not being balanced. Another developer of the era, Virgin Games, did a much better job with boss design. These fights require a balance of both offense and defense in order for the player to come out victorious. There are no power-ups to cheese them, and beating them offers a sense of accomplishment. Beating a boss in Super Metroid feels more like a hollow victory. Before I wrap up, I should mention the presentation. The music is excellent. I have all the usual adjectives to describe the soundtrack. The instrument selections are vast and varied and fit the dark and moody atmosphere of Planet Zebus. The melodies are vastly superior to the NES game. Meridia is almost quiet, giving that isolation feeling captured so beautifully in Metroid 2. The runes located in Norfair have an almost ancient Rome gladiator vibe to them, really building up to the climactic encounter with Ridley. It is a sound I cannot say I recall hearing in any game from the 16-bit era, and I found the piece to be rather distinctive. Bryn Star is more upbeat, matching the more organic and less bleak nature of this part of the planet. The level of variety is excellent, the samples used from the sound chip are expertly picked, nothing repeats too often, and nothing ever grates on the ears. However, if one wants a proper analysis on if the music is objectively good or not, I would recommend checking out the Metroid Music Theory video done by the 8-Bit Music Theory channel. This breaks down the game's soundtrack at a far deeper level than I ever could, as I lack the expertise or vocabulary. 
Graphically, Super Metroid is above average. Following in the footsteps of Metroid 2, Samus looks amazing. Her detail is excellent, the arm cannon is always on the correct side, and the transition from facing different directions is smooth. All of the animations are excellent, honestly, with some of the better running animations found in the era. Background tiles are also well crafted. The different areas of Zebus feel distinct, and I found it very easy to identify exactly where I was on the planet. Color usage is great, with the foreground always standing out against the more subdued backgrounds, yet overall detail is never sacrificed. A few areas do have the grid-like feel found in the previous generation of hardware, but the shift in color palettes keeps these simplistic areas looking visually interesting. Super Metroid certainly feels like a AAA title with a quality soundtrack and above average visual design. However, I think the game's legacy and longevity will ultimately rest on the game design rather than the presentation, and it is here where I think Super Metroid ultimately shines. Many games from the 80s and 90s are really beginning to show their age, especially with the indie scene and major developers continuing to push the envelope on what is possible in side-scrolling genres. Super Metroid is one of the few games that can hold its own against modern competition. One does not have to enjoy drawing maps on grid paper to enjoy Super Metroid. One does not need to recall the pre-internet days of sharing information on the playground in order to progress. One does not need to have lived through the days of having just two or three video games to play a year and therefore not minding obtuse game design extending gameplay time by hours. Playing Super Metroid in 1994 is not required to enjoy Super Metroid in 2019. This is truly a timeless game. The world design is excellent, perfectly blending both linear design concepts and open world elements to create a planet Zebus that is intuitive to traverse. It feels like the developers considered how the player would experience the world every step of the way, sometimes leaving things open, other times pushing the player through a linear path, sometimes gating the player off with one-way doors or other obstacles. Not since the original Super Mario Brothers have I felt like the developers were considering nearly every option available to the player when constructing every tile of the game world. It is truly impressive, especially considering this game is many times larger. Not only is progression thoughtful and logical, the game communicates new elements to the player by way of the game world, rather than text boxes and tutorials. It makes every upgrade feel meaningful and useful when the developers can show the player how it will help them on their journey, rather than tell them. Super Metroid is the standard in how an in-game map should work. The map is a tool guiding the player forward and offering clues and marking progress, and is not a checklist or a crutch. Sure, a boss is marked on the map, but the player will still have to use thought and reason to get there. Super Metroid understands the journey is more important than the destination. Without a doubt, Super Metroid is superior to its predecessors. It takes those opening moments from Metroid 1 and stretches them through the entire game. It takes the elements from Metroid 2, like more rewards for exploring in a better map, and perfects them. In fact, this is not just the best of the first three Metroids, it is the best designed 16-bit title I have ever played. A game I can recommend to everyone of any skill level and of any generation.